from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So I want to welcome everyone to our TOPS program for today, the Advances in Raman Spectroscopy for Analysis of Cultural Heritage Materials. Both to all of you on site, and um, sorry, I'm waving because I'm seeing all these wonderful people I haven't seen for ages. And also we have about 30 odd people um, externally viewing this, so welcome to you too. We're very, very much, very glad that you can join us. We have four speakers today, so I'm going to keep it very brief. I'll introduce all the speakers and then we'll move through all four talks so that we can keep you engaged and intrigued. We're going to start with a short introduction on in situ Raman spectroscopy and sort of an overall reasoning for why we use uh, Raman by Dr. Lynn Brostoff uh, from the Library of Congress here. And she obtained a PhD in chemistry from the University of Amsterdam and held positions at the Smithsonian Institution, the National Gallery of Art, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And at the library, Dr. Brossoff conducts, conducts research that currently focuses on corrosive media, including iron gall and verdigris pigments. Our second speaker, Dr. Richard Bormitt, will give an overview of advances in instrumentation in Raman. And Dr. Bormitt has been with Renishaw since 1996 and the business manager for the Raman products since 2002. He earned his PhD in analytical chemistry in 1996 from the University of Pittsburgh, working with Professor Sanford Asher on new instrument technology for deep UV Raman spectroscopy. Our third speaker is Dr. Sylvia Centino, who will talk about applications of Raman spectroscopy to the analysis of cultural heritage objects at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Dr. Centino has been a research scientist in the Department of Scientific Research there since 1996. She earned a PhD in chemistry from Universidad Nacional de La Plata in Argentina, excuse my pronunciation, and her research includes the investigation of photographs, paintings, and works of art on paper. She's authored numerous articles and peer-reviewed publications on the application of Raman spectroscopy. Our final speaker needs no introduction to most of you. A very warm welcome to Dr. Marco Leona, who will discuss SIRS and its application to the cultural heritage field. Dr. Leona is the head of the Department of Scientific Research at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He obtained his PhD in chemistry, crystallography, and mineralo mineralogy at the Università degli Studi di Pavia. I'm mangling things this week. And formerly held science, scientist positions at the Los, Los Angeles County Museum of Art and the Freer Gallery of Art here in Washington. His research interests include infrared and Raman spectroscopy studies of indigo and Maya blue pigments. We're going to move directly from each talk to the next, so if you could please note down your questions, we'll hold those till the end, and then we'll invite all the speakers back up to the podium to address those questions. And any of those of you watching externally, if you have questions, we can also take those, if you type those in, uh, we'll take those at the end. So I'd like to uh, bring Lynn here up to the podium to start our first talk and introduce that. Thank you. Thanks, Fenella, and uh, welcome everyone, and thanks for your interest and uh, for coming, and welcome people who are on the web. Um, <coughs> oops. Um, Raman spectroscopy has, of course, been around for a very long time, uh, but it's really only in the last decade or so that it has become an important technique. Um, in many fields, uh, especially in the cultural heritage field, but also in forensics and, and other fields. And, and this has a lot to do with advances in the instrumentation itself, and particularly for our field uh, in the development of Raman microscopy, uh, because we often uh, need to identify materials that are very tiny particles of colorants, um, and uh, the, the coupling with the microscope has really been key to uh, its importance in our field. Um, we uh, also, Raman is really great because it gives us molecular information. So we get information about the molecule that is quite, uh, is quite the complement to what we may find by x-ray fluorescence or other techniques that give us the elements in materials. 
And we are constantly uh, probing and, and being asked to understand what the materials are in our special collections. And that's very important information for the care and preservation, as well as just the study historically of these materials. So uh, the library has, of course, like other cultural heritage institutions, become very interested in using Raman and bringing it online in our, as one of our analytical tools. And uh, we uh, obtained an instrument a couple years ago, and I was uh, quite happy to be asked to lead that um, acquisition. And this is the instrument that we have at the library. Uh, it's a Renaissance Invia microscope uh, system. And uh, we have two lasers that we obtained for it, uh, 514 and 785. Um, it is a refurbished instrument, but uh, one of the great things is it's an upgradable, and it was upgraded, and we can keep adding to it and refining it, which has been actually really a terrific aspect of the instrument. Um, and one thing that we have uh, done uh, in terms of accessorizing our instrument is a little, still pretty rare in our field is we obtained uh, what's called a macro sampling arm, which actually is really just uh, an extension for the objective. And it screws right onto the objective turret. It has two mirrors to uh, divert the beam. And on the very end, uh, here, kind of right here at the end, we can just screw on any of the objectives. So we can use different magnifications with this macro sampling arm. And the, it's integrated with both the eyepieces and the camera. So we can remotely move it as well as visualize through the objective arm where we are. And why we really like it is because we can now do in situ Raman spectroscopy, um, well, microscopy, because we are doing it at a micro scale. Um, and that means that we can pull a, an object or work of art up to the instrument and have um, something that wouldn't fit on the stage, the microscope stage. And we can work really, uh, I consider, completely non-invasively and very safely. So this has really been a boon to our analytical capabilities, especially at the library. We have primarily a paper-based collection, and we really cannot sample. Sometimes we sample, but they're like crumbs. So we never get a beautiful cross-section like paintings people get. So yeah, I did want to mention that the it has pretty uh, it has actually very good throughput um, this arm even though you have two mirrors, and uh, I am often working at the lowest power I can when I'm working on an actual collection item in order to work very safely. So I'm actually very happy that I can work um, really in the even down sometimes to 0.1 milliwatt, but I'm normally working um, 0.25 up to about one milliwatt, and I get very good, still very good signal to noise ratio for many types of materials. So um, that makes me very happy. So um, when, uh, this is a, an example I just wanted to run through uh, kind of like by way of an introduction of our speakers um, who really have what I consider advanced uh, the field in different ways, either through instrumentation or specific applications in cultural heritage, um, just show uh, briefly um, some of the applications that we've uh, been uh, doing over the last couple years. And uh, when we got the instrument up and running, we had a, a pretty in-depth technical study uh, currently um, um, uh, going on, which was uh, studying uh, uh, the Noravant Gospels, which is a medieval uh, illuminated uh, manuscript from uh, Armenia from the 15th century. And um, we had already done a lot of X-ray fluorescence and X-ray diffraction and scanning electron microscopy on samples we had taken. And we'd gotten a lot of instruments. So it was actually quite interesting to see what the Raman added in that we hadn't gotten. And you can see here a picture of um, it had been disbound, so this is uh, the illumination of St. Mark, uh, under the arm right there on a table um, up at the microscope. 
So uh, what we often do in our field are technical studies where we want to reconstruct the palette. Um, this was particularly interesting because there's not that much known about Armenian painting in the Middle Ages, but also because there were a lot of condition issues and alterations in the pigments. So um, first, as I said, we conducted XRF, and XRF gave us you know, great information like it usually does. It's a non-invasive technique, and the inorganics uh, uh, we're pretty easy to guess from the elements we got, so we knew uh, with pretty good certainty that we had, uh, we're dealing with vermilion, orpiment, uh, um, red lead, and uh, tin white, which is very unusual to find. That was a very rare find, um, as well as a uh, cobalt glass. So this is a very early occurrence of what's known in our field as small pigment. And we, as I said, we did SEM, uh, X-ray diffraction, FTIR. It didn't add a lot of information, but it confirmed what we thought we had with XRF and told us that we had ultramarine mixed in with the smalt. So that was a great finding and really you know, gave us beautiful XRD pattern from the tin white. So there were still quite a few unknowns, uh, especially organic materials that we, we knew had to be there, but we, we didn't have information about yet. So the ramen was really great in adding in uh, not only good uh, extra information and confirmation of the ultramarine, but the indigo, that the green was produced by mixing the yellow orpiment with blue indigo dye, which is a natural dye, um, to produce that. And ramen is terrific, and I'll show you an example of the spectrum, or one spectrum we obtained uh, showing the indigo. And ramen is really great for finding indigo, which is important dye material, uh, colorant material that we see a lot. Um, and we had a little surprise, which was terrific, when we found that the orpiment was mixed with a related arsenic sulfide, which is uh, Realgar. So um, I'll show you an example, uh, first of the ultramarine, and on the top you can see a spectrum of the reference. And on the bottom is the spectrum that was obtained with the macro sampling arm in the blue, and we did a lot of little particles. And, you know, which is which? They're like, you can't get a more exact match than that. And so one of the things that makes ramen really terrific in our field is its specificity. So you see that you get a very specific pattern that tells you, yes, this is the mineral lapis lazuli ultramarine. Actually, it's lazulite, which we confirmed with uh, x-ray diffraction. And uh, I'm showing here uh, several different areas, and I know that the, you know, the peaks are kind of small, so you're going to have to trust me here that this these was very specific information, um, not only that we had orpiment, which is super easy, it's a great scatterer, and it's very easy to find, um, but that, uh, that we had the Realgar and its alteration product, Para Realgar, which we were able to find with ramen, um, which would be very difficult to pick out by other techniques. Um, and on the top spectrum there, you can see that we not only have um, the orpiment in the green area, but we have very definite peaks from the indigo. And if you look, if you blow up those regions, you can see, you know, you would be able to see yes, with great confidence, we absolutely have indigo here. Um, we were quite interested in trying to understand what was going on in terms of darkening in a lot of the red areas. So we had known from right off the bat with XRF that we had a combination of lead pigment and mercury containing pigment, which we knew had to be vermilion and red lead, which we confirmed with X-ray diffraction. Um, it appeared initially like we had mostly red lead and a little bit of vermilion. So then when we did the ramen, it seemed like it was the other way around. Like we had great peaks for the vermilion and, you know, less information from the red lead, which um, is partly because vermilion is a great ramen scatterer. So you're more sensitive to it. But red lead is a pretty good scatterer, too. Um, so this was kind of interesting. And so using, uh, you know, scanning really across some of these red areas, especially in the darkened areas uh, with, the, with the ramen, and, um, we're able to see that, um, indeed, we, we really were mostly seeing the vermilion, and then there would be spots where we would pick up the red lead. So you can see it's very specific, the ramen. You have peaks that you associate specifically with the red lead and then with the vermilion here. 
Um, and this was kind of curious, as I said, because um, I was like, well, wait a second, why are we seeing more of, like what seems to be more vermilion by Raman? And uh, it, it became apparent that it was the explanation is likely that uh, not only was there mixing of the red lead and the vermilion by the artist, mostly for economical reasons, that was typical. You take the cheaper red lead and mix it with the expensive vermilion, but probably the vermilion was applied as a glaze on top that would really, it was a way of getting a fake vermilion color, which was the expensive color they really wanted. So what I show on the upper right um, is a mock-up that was uh, kindly created uh, by Cindy Connolly Ryan um, that had the red lead with a, just a, a glaze of vermilion on top. And you can see, gosh, it looks exactly like what I was getting when I was looking at the object. And so this really seemed to reinforce that we're not only identifying what pigments are there, but we're getting some information. We can't take a cross-section to see those layers because there's just not enough material, but we're getting some information that supports this idea of the vermilion being applied as a glaze, which really helps us explain some of the uh, interaction that's gone on and the darkening that has occurred. So um, unfortunately, we didn't get an actual degradation product. You saw there was this darkening, this kind of silvery gray surface that developed, and we were not able to confirm that what seems like you would get a lead sulfide from the interaction of the sulfide mineral and the lead oxide mineral, but um, that's something we still need to do, and especially because this deteriorated red lead is rampant in our collections. Um, we don't have uh, a lot of medium on paper-based works of art, and there are not really coatings. So when pigments that are more prone to oxidation are used works of art on paper, often they are really subject to a lot of uh, interaction with the air, the environment, with sulfides in the um, pollutants, and um, are basically just less protected. And this was, uh, a, this is a, something of interest in Eastern art. Um, we see a lot of converted red lead or darkened red lead. And the conservator very, is a very interesting topic, actually, because it's known from some sources that sometimes in Eastern art, they may have purposely silvered their red lead as a decorative effect. So she brought the question to me, um, can you tell if it's supposed to be silvery looking? Is it supposed to have silvered? You know, I think sometimes it's obvious it's kind of mottled and uneven, and you say, well, no, couldn't be on purpose. It might be on purpose over here, but not over here. So this is a, a beautiful uh, print, a Japanese print, uh, that was uh, brought to conservation. And actually, the red lead was fairly successfully treated by a hydrogen peroxide method to convert it back from this dark brown to back to a more orangey red. And um, although uh, didn't detect what might be a lead sulfide or something that was the conversion product, I show you here that it was quite interesting um, that in the red lead, bright red lead area, such as in the uh, hair ornament, you can clearly see uh, that red lead, which is a mixed oxide, that you can pick out the peaks for the PBO, the Massico, part of that mineral um, apart from the PB203. So that's, as I said, it's a mixed oxidation state. And there have been, in the literature, some people have mentioned that they think that the massica part is the kind of Achilles heel of that pigment. And so you could actually look to see, does my particular red lead have a lot of this? And um, it seems to be something interesting to follow up on. Um, and just so that I don't, you know, so that you don't think that we couldn't get enough, very much information by Raman on this print, we uh, very nicely again uh, uh, saw that the green robe was orpiment and indigo and that the yellow was orpiment in the robe. And um, just, you know, finally, I, I just wanted to mention that the library is intensely interested in the analysis of inks, and that's one of the reasons that we're pursuing Raman. And then one of the reasons I've invited some real experts uh, on ink analysis by Raman here today um, from the Met who will speak about that. Um, and you can just see that, you know, just take a pen or pencil and get some very specific information by Raman. And uh, we actually collaborated briefly with the Holocaust Museum, who brought us a, a diary, a Holocaust-era diary. 
and uh, there was a blue ink and it had turned brown and we were wondering were there different inks, were, were they adding things when they got low, um, what was going on, is it the degradation of the ink. And in this case, uh, we're able to identify either methyl blue, which can be a component of uh, aniline blue or aniline blue itself. So um, that was actually a great result. And my, um, as Fenella mentioned, uh, uh, one of my real interests that I'm pursuing here is research into iron gall ink, and I think Sylvia will talk about this as well. But Raman is fantastic for looking for identifying iron gall ink, which was kind of a surprise to me when I first started doing it. Um, and not only can you very successfully and non-invasively identify iron gall ink. Uh, complexes on documents, and believe me, the library has a lot of iron gall ink. Um, but um, as we are conducting study, and I have a collaboration going with University of Maryland now and creating model precipitates and studying the basic chemistry of iron gall ink, it's very interesting. Um, we've started to see that we have some diagnostic uh, shifts, such as this, that happen with natural aging that we are now pursuing to understand better the chemistry and the aging of iron gall ink. So in conclusion, um, I just would like to emphasize that we are very excited uh, that um, Dr. Bormitt and Dr. Centeno and Dr. Leona have agreed to come and share some of the advances that they have been involved in and the work they have been doing uh, that you know, helps us in our work and, and we're happy that they have agreed to share it with uh, all of you. And I think you'll find their lectures really fascinating. Thank you. And next up, we have Dr. Borman. Great, thank you. Uh, I have many more things to talk about than I probably have time, so you're going to have to really watch me and uh, rein me in if I start to uh, drone on. Uh, hopefully, uh, some of the things that you'll see from me here will help you sort of understand what uh, flexibility you might have with some ro current Raman instrumentation, uh, what we're trying to do with Raman instrumentation as far as bringing it to new areas or giving it new capabilities. And I'll give you uh, one or two examples at the very end of some in new it Raman interfaces that uh, uh, we've been uh, uh, installed in several different places and people have a, a great interest in. So just to give everybody sort of a same starting point as to what is Raman spectroscopy, that's what most of my talk is about. It is simply the process of illuminating a sample with a single frequency light source, namely a laser, and then looking at the, all the other wavelengths that would come off that are inelastically scattered. So usually when you're excited with the laser, you might have fluorescence. We don't care about that. We want inelastically scattered light. So this. Uh, 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 slide just simply shows you uh, the basic of the experiment, plus it shows you two pictures. When you're looking at Raman instrumentation, you're generally nowadays going to see two types. One is a bench type type of spectrometer, which sits on a bench, doesn't move, doesn't do anything. But the other type that you will see will be portable uh, types of Raman instrumentation, which is the other sort of large bulky thing in the, the lower corner there. Uh, there are many spectrometers much smaller than that, and you can actually get them handheld uh, if that were uh, your desire. Uh, from a practical perspective, they all perform the same uh, uh, experiment. Single frequency excitation, measure the inelastically scattered light. As a chemist, I have to give you a little bit of chemistry. I have to show you a couple diagrams and a couple e e equations. So when we excite a sample with a single frequency laser, there are a few processes that can occur. Uh, the one that we're interested in is shown as circled here as Raman Stokes. Uh, there are several different types of Raman experiments that you can do. Almost everything that uh, you'll see today or most 90% of what you might run into is going to be normal Stokes Raman shifted light. Single frequency laser, high energy, brings it to a virtual state. It excites down to an excited vibrational state. So the way I describe it, there's a transfer of momentum from the uh, laser light to the molecule, which causes the light to change frequency. That's what we're interested in. Uh, but there's also another uh, interesting phenomenon that, might, uh, that you have to be aware of, and that is because Raman spectroscopy uses a laser, there are 
a very large number of laser excitation wavelengths that you could actually use to do your Raman measurements. As Lynn measured, she has two downstairs on her instrument, a red and a green, very popular lasers. But I personally have used more than 15 different excitation wavelengths to perform Raman measurements. And the reason for that is that as if you can bring a excitation wavelength close to the absorption band of a material, you can actually get selectivity for the material that's actually causing the absorbance. So you can actually look at trace materials and much larger bulk material if necessary or get uh, selectivities that dramatically improve your ability to identify materials. So here's one of the equations that I'm, I think that you need to sort of uh, know or be aware of. Uh, you don't have to understand all the terminology. What you need to sort of focus on is what I've described as, one, if I am making a Raman measurement, it is an analytical technique. The intensity of the light, of the Raman light that I measure, is going to be proportional to the number of molecules. The second thing that you need to know is that the intensity of the light is going to be also proportional to uh, a term called polarizability, the alpha term. And this can vary with excitation wavelength, as you'll see in a moment. And the third thing that you, I want you to pick up from this particular slide is that the intensity that you get for various peaks could very well depend on the frequency of the laser, this uh, new zero plus or minus new m to the fourth power. So that as I change laser frequency, I can get a higher probability of producing a Raman spectrum. Uh, so what does the Raman spectrum look like? You've already seen a few. You probably are already aware of what a vibrational spectrum looks like. It's inelastic light scattering. I show you three uh, spectra here. Very simple materials. One is silicon. The frequency of the Raman band is going to be proportional to the uh, uh, vibrational strength of the bond. Silicon's very heavy. It's got a low frequency. You see the peak near 520. If I actually create a silicon carbon hybrid, silicon carbide, I now actually have a different crystal structure. Uh, I now have a couple different vibrational types that I have, so I get more uh, peaks. So each vibrational system uh, creates its own uh, peak within a system. And if I go to pure carbon, same crystal structure as silicon carbon being a lighter atom, it has a, its Raman band at a slightly higher frequency, 1332. So if you are looking at crystal structures, Raman spectroscopy can be is exquisitely sensitive to changes in morphology, changes in crystal form of a particular material that makes it very, very powerful. Okay, so when we, as I mentioned before, the Raman intensity is going to be proportional to, uh, under normal circumstances, uh, what we call new to the fourth term. The shorter the excitation wavelength, the higher the probability of creating a Raman spectrum. And that can actually be a very, very powerful technique. So here's a simulated spectrum I uh, produced for you. It actually is uh, highlighted, I have in gray actually an absorption or fluorescence spectrum to show you what the relative intensity uh, of your Raman spectrum might be if you changed excitation wavelength. If there's no resonance enhancement, just going from 785 nanometer excitation to 514, the two most common excitation wavelengths, you have a five-fold increase in the probability of producing a Raman photon. If you're using low laser power, if your sample is a uh, low efficiency scatterer, changing to shorter excitation wavelengths can be highly beneficial. And in fact, if I were to, able to go all the way to the ultraviolet, 244, the same number of uh, photons on the sample, I have 100 times greater probability of producing a Raman uh, signature using 244 versus 785. So changing your excitation wavelength can be very beneficial. Now on the other side, you change excitation wavelength to try to avoid fluorescence. So you may not be able to choose any excitation wavelength you want. Fluorescence can be uh, an interfering uh, phenomena and sometimes we choose excitation wavelengths to avoid fluorescence. Here's a, a perfect example I love to show. These are three different polymers. Tempted to measure these polymers, uh, Teflon, Kapton, and polyvalidine fluoride using 514 nanometer excitation. Teflon wasn't so hard. Kapton was impossible. Uh, the uh, fluoride polymer, uh, you know, you can pick out peaks, not great. 
when I brought this particular sample to 244 nanometer excitation, 244, if you can use it, it's a great wavelength. It's very uh, complicated, very difficult to use, though. However, all the fluorescence from these materials was shifted so far to the red that 244 provided very clear fluorescence free spectra for each of these particular polymers. So when you're looking at Raman excitation, Raman instrumentation, the choice of excitation wavelength can have a dramatic impact on your ability to be successful to actually measure a spectrum. Okay, on the same side, well, it looks like I have a little font problem, uh, but when we look at changing the excitation wavelength, the other thing that you need to know is that the relative intensity of, the, of a mixture for the bands could actually change. So this is a uh, couple Raman spectra of a uh, quartz inclusion, which is basically wa uh, methane water inclusion in quartz. I scaled both spectra to have the same intensity in water. Uh, using two uh, wavelengths, 514 and 244, and you should immediately notice that the methane peak near 2930 is dramatically higher with the 244 nanometer excitation than with the visible. So just choosing an excitation wavelength in the deep UV gave me higher selectivity, higher sensitivity to the methane part of this particular inclusion. Okay. Uh, so the last uh, sort of part of this equation that I want to sort of uh, talk about and mention to you is the polarizability term. Every molecule, every vibration has what's called a polarizability, and this is going to affect your intensity. And what I want you to understand is how the change in the wavelength is going to potentially affect your intensity. In this particular case, I want to talk about resonance Raman. This is the equation for the polarizability term. Really complicated, but there's just one thing I sort of want you to notice, and that is in the uh, denominator, uh, for far from resonance, it's a sum over all electronic states, it's called a virtual state. However, when you bring the Raman excitation wavelength close to an absorption band, only one electronic state becomes important. And if you notice the term, it's a difference. How close is the laser frequency? to the absorption frequency. That term can approach zero. Your intensity can dramatically increase. Resonance Raman can dramatically increase your uh, intensities sometimes a million fold. Uh, it's very, very easy to get uh, very strong spectra from very dilute or weak scatterers if you can use resonance Raman. A uh, perfect example of this uh, is actually a, a figure that I've been using since graduate school days. And this is actually Raman spectra measured at different excitation wavelengths for uh, uh, hemoglobin. Or in fact, actually, this is myoglobin, not hemoglobin. But what you see in dark is the absorption spectrum of the hemoglobin. If we move from the ultraviolet, where I have the amide backbone, towards the visible, where I have absorption from the heme group within the protein, out to the red, where I have the absorption from the iron ligand bond within hemoglobin, if I look at the Raman spectrum in each of those areas, you are selectively getting the Raman spectrum of that small part of this very, very large molecule. So at near 785, I get the uh, vibration of the metal ligand bond. At 406, I get the excitation of the heme group itself. In the near UV to 60, uh, 300 nanometers, I'm seeing the protein side chain vibrations. If I go to the deep ultraviolet, I see the vibration, the Raman spectrum of the protein secondary structure of this very large protein. So take home message is, when you're looking at Raman spectroscopy, you have to give some consideration to the excitation wavelength that you're using because that excitation wavelength can affect the results. Okay, the last sort of example, and I, I sort of dumped this in here because uh, I know uh, looking at black and carbonaceous materials is of interest. This is actually another example of uh, single wall nanotubes. This is a, a, a material under great intense interest, and this is another example of resonance Raman, a bulk material measured at, uh, in this case they show things, wavelengths in EV, starting in the red around 800 nanometers, going all the way up to uh, near the blue, blue-green, and you can see the same material giving you underlying band structures, different Raman bands, different shifts, depending on the excitation wavelength. So if you're looking at black ink, even carbon-based black ink, how they make this carbon uh,
base black ink, what types of graphite structures are in there, uh, it can change with excitation wavelength. And over on the bottom left, that's actually the absorption spectra for nanotubes. And people actually use this information to get uh, a lot of information about the size, length, uh, and nature of the nanotubes. So knowing that you can measure a Raman spectrum, that you have a signature uh, associated with the vibrational bond energy of a particular material, how do we use uh, the Raman information that we uh, obtain? Uh, number one is really, as you've seen, is the composition of materials. What's there? How much is there? Is the material been uh, changed? Is it under a, a, a state of stress? So if someone takes a plastic and deforms it, it's going to shift some of the trauma peaks. If you take a crystal, put it under pressure, you're going to see a change, small peak positional changes in your Raman spectra. You can get crystal symmetry. If you have single crystal material, you can actually rotate your crystal under polarized Raman light and actually learn information about what the symmetry group of that particular crystal is. We can look at the width of material. How, what is the quality of the crystal? What types of deformation have come to it? And of course, the analytical question is always, what is the intensity? How much is actually there? Okay. So as Lynn mentioned, uh, the Raman microscope is actually really an ideal platform for Raman, for Raman spectroscopy. So most instruments uh, that are sold really are designed for Raman microscopy, even if you don't see an optical microscope. The design purpose is usually to put as much light into a small area as possible and to collect all that light. So microscopes are really, really ideal for that. They have a lot of flexibility. The optical microscope has very high spatial resolution. You get to use all the tools, polarized light, fluorescence on an optical microscope to identify regions of interest that you uh, often uh, have necessary anyway. And they have very high collection efficiency. A standard optical microscope I list here uh, can operate from 230 nanometer excitation. Uh, I've listed here 830, but we've actually, you will see optical microscopes operating all the way to 1064 nanometer excitation. Again, the wavelength depends on what types of barriers you have to fluorescence or sampling uh, uh, for your particular systems. But there are other ways uh, to do Raman uh, microscopy outside of an optical microscope. And I have two examples here. One is actually within an AFM, where the Raman system is actually coupled externally to an AFM system. Uh, the second one is on the right is where we've actually coupled the Raman system into an SEM. One of the challenges for Raman microscopy is that just looking at a sample optically, you can't always differentiate areas of interest. Where, is, where should I be making my Raman measurement? Where am I likely to have the biggest impact and find the material that's going to help me identify the chemical processes or aging or actually materials that are there? Using other microscopy techniques, it's often uh, quite simple to identify regions of interest, and I'll give you a couple of examples. So for example, this is a, uh, a SEM image, an optical microscope white light image of a simple forensic swipe taken across a simulated material to pick up particles. When I look at this under an optical microscope, the contrast is so poor, I really can't see the uh, individual fibers because of blurring. I can't see the particles that it's picked up. The moment I put this into an SEM, the image contrast dramatically increases. I can now actually use the SEM tools of using a mean atomic number or elemental composition or electronic structure, CL, to try and identify regions of interest that are different within this particular sample. In this case, you, we look for silicon or we look for the calcium or we look for the fluoride and we can identify these particles. However, as with X-ray fluorescence techniques, just because I know fluorine is present doesn't tell me what the polymer is. The trick is to bring your Raman, mic your Raman microscopy into the SEM, so once I find one of these interesting particles, I can take a Raman measurement for it, on it, and actually identify what the molecular species is, rather than just the elemental species. And there are, it, it's reasonably uh, simple to sort of hook these things into an SEM. Uh, there are a couple constraints. Large chambers don't usually work very well, and which means we have a sort of what we call center of the flange distance. And you need some type of working space above your sample to be able to work in an SEM. For an AFM, there's a couple of imaging techniques that are very, very popular. The most uh, uh, 
easy to sort of interpret and look at are things called phase contrast and topology. Usually you're working in an AFM if the material that you're trying to analyze is of, quote, the nanometric scale. You need much higher spatial resolutions to try and identify regions of interest and locate uh, materials that are going to be able to uh, uh, be of interest to you. And with an AFM microscope, the last time I counted, I found 40 different contrast modes for use within the AFM microscope. So if you can't see it or find it with a combined optical AFM microscope, it's probably not there. Uh, but there are a couple different ways to couple into an AFM. Some of them are very simple. They fit on top of uh, an inverted microscope in one picture here. And in the other picture, which you saw early on, is we actually do remote coupling into an AFM. In this particular case, it was a simple Brooker Innova AFM. Uh, and we actually do side sampling. So we actually have to match up the sampling point for Raman to where the tip is at. After which we can actually then scan the sample. The tip and the Raman are made co-locally and you can get simultaneous information for this, uh, uh, these types of microscopes. Okay, so to sort of just come back to the SEM, I'm gonna show you an example of how the SEM was used by one of our users in Europe uh, and the main reason they wanted to use the SEM again was because it had analytical tools that allowed it to do X-ray analysis of basically elemental composition and catholuminescence. Uh, and the example for AFM really is simply uh, looking at graphene materials. Uh, it's very easy to tell how many layers of this material are from Raman. It's not so easy to tell just from AFM. Okay, uh, skip that one. I wanted to go, oh, no, I lost my some slides. Whoops, let me look real quick. You know what? We lost some of my slides for the art artifact one. I apologize for that. They must be hidden. Okay. So I will, uh, unfortunately, uh, if, are these presentations going to be available uh, otherwise, so they will be able to see some of these slides of a wonderful uh, SEM application, unfortunately. So uh, I guess I have a couple of opportunities to talk about the uh, and some information again. So this is a uh, demonstration basically of how the Raman AFM coupling works. Uh, what you see here is just the tip of the AFM coming in. We actually bring a laser through a tip or uh, through an objective to where the tip is, you can actually simultaneously scan the sample underneath and do simultaneous Raman uh, SOM. There's a, a, a SNOM measurement. And there are some advantages for this. Every AFM is different. The one I'm showing you here is, was made by Nanonics and it's designed to fit onto a uh, standard optical microscope and use standard uh, optical microscope objectives. Okay? Uh, and one of the things that uh, reasons I put this in here is to sort of touch on a topic that I think uh, Marco's going to talk a little bit more about uh, later, and that is when we look at Raman spectroscopy, I mentioned that changing the wavelength of light, changing the intensity of the laser can change your uh, Raman spectrum, but there's another way to change your Raman spectrum, and that's something called SIR, Surface Enhanced Raman Spectroscopy, where we change the electric field term, the E term, not by changing the intensity of the laser, but by using a, a SIRS particle, a gold particle, uh, in this particular case. If I can, at the end of my AFM tip, put a metallized particle, I can actually increase the electric field and increase my sensitivity to the nanometric area that that tip is actually going to be touching. And in this particular case, I show you the absorption spectra of various little gold particles so we can actually tune these particles to different wavelengths to be used within the optical microscope. So these can be tuned to the wavelengths that you actually have to provide you the enhancement necessary. In this particular case, these particles have been put onto the surface of a very thin film of strained silicon that's on top of bulk silicon. The Raman spectra you see uh, below the little pictograph actually shows you two spectra. One, where I make a measurement away from the particles, where I have a much weaker uh, strained silicon peak, which is shifted to slightly lower energy. 
Uh, but when I come near the particles, this little gold particle creates an enhanced electric field that gives me dramatically improved sensitivity just to the material at the surface. So if you're looking at really, really thin surfaces, nanometer thin films, you're going to normally, under an optical microscope, collect from microns deep thick. If I can do a surface enhancement, I can get surface sensitivity on these particular materials. And this is what the tip looks like. You can see here's a tip through an optical microscope on a gold surface, and at the very bottom of that tip I have a metallized particle. And this gives me the enhancement to get uh, dramatically improved spatial and depth sensitivity, surface sensitivity, uh, on a nanometric scale. Okay, so when we, instead of dispersing these particles on the sample, now I do the same experiment on the same sample of strained silicon on top of bulk silicon, only this time my SIRS particle is at the tip of my AFM. You can see the same effect here. You can see as I bring the tip in contact with the surface, I get enhanced surface sensitivity. Now getting surface enhanced sensitivity is great, but the other advantage for this is it gives me a dramatically improved spatial resolution. So under normal optical microscope, if I'm doing a map, I create a Raman map, I'm limited by the optical uh, resolution of a microscope, one micron, half a micron maybe if I'm working in the visible. The moment I use that nanometric size gold tip, I now look at the lower uh, picture here, you can see dramatically improved spatial resolution. Now I'm making Raman measurements with spatial resolutions on the order of 50 to 100 nanometers, very simply. And there are researchers that have actually used this to go to uh, a few nanometers, 5 to 10 nanometers, quite simply. Uh, so, and again, this is usually a type of image and measurements done in two modes. One, you make a measurement with the tip uh, far from the sample. You make a measurement with the tip on the sample, and you do the difference. And the difference gives you the spectrum of the material that's actually in contact with the gold particle or the metallized particle. Uh, a couple other examples. Dragging this gold tip just along a, a nanotube, we can actually see changes in a nanometric fiber uh, that as we go along the fiber itself, which is telling us that there are twists or bends or defects in this particular uh, nanotube. Okay, but there are other ways to sort of increase your spatial resolution, and the last uh, sort of picture I have here is uh, really of a solid immersion lens. Now, one of the reasons that we sort of sometimes lack spatial resolution is because we're limited by wavelength and refractive index. If I do what's called a solid immersion lens, the refractive index of the material on top of the sample is very high. I can now dramatically improve my spatial resolution using the same exact uh, wavelengths. In this particular case, this is uh, 514 nanometer light using a uh, crystal, single crystal, high refractive index material placed on the surface. I can still scan it, and I can now approach 100 nanometer spatial resolution with some of our Raman instrumentation without any special tricks and without an AFM. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening. I hope uh, this has inspired you to sort of think of new ways or new configurations for Raman instruments and how the newly available solid state wavelengths in other microscope sampling uh, techniques can actually help you in some of your research. Thank you. And I'd like to... Uh Ask Dr. Centino to come up. Can I also gently remind everyone, if you've got your cell phones on, can you just put them on vibrate? Sylvia, please. Switch up, please, then. Okay. So first, I would like to thank uh, Lynn Brostoff and the Library of Congress for inviting me, and also Renesha for making uh, the workshop possible. Um, Today, as instructed by my host, I'll be focusing on um, a few applications to the uh, analysis of photographs and some inks, and I'll use uh, lithographic inks as uh, an excuse to discuss briefly synthetic organic pigments. Um, most of the measurements that I'll be showing today were done using this uh, Renaissance system 1000 that looks ancient at this point. 
uh, using both uh, 785 and 514 excitations. And uh, for some of the uh, logwood inks uh, that I'll be discussing, um, we use a Horiba instrument uh, on uh, 488 excitation at the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia. This daguerreotype uh, that's in a private collection was on display in uh, 2005 at the George Eastman House. And um, within like three weeks, one month on display, it started to show this white haze that you see here. Um, other plates in the collection also showed, uh, started to form that white haze. Uh, similar forms of deterioration have been observed in other daguerreotypes. This is a good example. Uh, this is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum. This plate was on display during the 1970s, and it was then that it started to show these white spots and uh, white haze. And before I go into characterizing the chemistry of the white haze, I would like to mention briefly how daguerreotypes were made in the 19th century. Uh, a silver copper plate is exposed to um, halogen vapors. Um, Light-sensitive silver allies are formed. And the latent image is developed by um, exposing it to mercury vapors, and the vapors condense preferentially in the areas that have been struck by light, forming a, um, a silver uh, mercury amalgam. The unexposed silver salts are removed by washing, and finally the plate is uh, washed, is, is treated with a gold chloride solution, a, a, a step that is called uh, gilding. In the case of gilded plates, we'll have image particles that are composed of mercury, silver, gold, amalgam. So we first tried to characterize the chemistry of the white haze by X-ray fluorescence. And when we did X-ray fluorescence, we found uh, only the elements that one would expect for a gilded plate, but no compositional differences between areas that looked clean and areas that had a white haze. When we look at them by Raman, uh, this is a spectrum that we acquire in a white spot here, we found um, this um, band at 240 reciprocal centimeters at this characteristic of the silver chlorine stretch. While when we looked at the more like clean areas, we found this almost like a uh, flat um, spectrum. So silver chloride is present in the surface of the daguerreotypes and um, the possible sources of that uh, chlorine contamination are many. It could be the original processing, it could be the contam contamination from the environment, and it could also be uh, present there due to conservation treatments. And uh, for the particular case of the uh, plate that I showed in the previous slide, we found that um, there are um, substituted aromatic compounds present in the surface of the plate, and this is telling us that most likely the source of the contamination there is the environment. Uh, here you have the spectrum of those compounds and the, and the band due to the silver chlorine stretch shown out of range. Um, Raman is very sensitive for examining compounds in the surface of daguerreotypes because the daguerreotype image particles behave as a search substrate. So we are extremely sensitive at, uh, at identifying compounds on the surface of the daguerreotypes. Um, and also what happens is that, as we all know, silver chloride is photosensitive. So when exposed to light, it forms silver, redeposited silver, and that redeposited silver contributes to the cell substrate that is formed there. So we're extremely sensitive. Um, this is an SEM image that we acquired in a daguerreotype sample. Unfortunately, we didn't have the Raman integrated to the um, uh, SEM, as a, a rich shown, it would, but it would have been nice. But what we see here is how the uh, silver chloride is nucleating over the image particles. These uh, sort of like piles of pancakes are the um, image particles, and we see here how the silver chloride is nucleating on top of the image particles and also on the defects. But what I wanted to show here is that uh, when, the, when the sample is exposed to the uh, electron beam in the SEM, these uh, silver nodules start to be formed after two to three minutes. So SEM is not a suitable technique for examining daguerreotypes that are uh, contaminated with uh, chlorine. We also found that um, when the daguerreotypes are gilded, uh, those uh, gold layers do not protect the daguerreotype for, um, from uh, chlorine-induced uh, deterioration. And uh, even if those uh, gilding layers are in good uh, condition, they are complete, they haven't been abraded. Uh, again, when these uh, gilded samples are exposed to the electron beam, redeposited silver forms there. But things are a little bit more complicated. Uh, as um, It is well known that uh, the photosensitivity of silver chloride increases when it's in the presence of 
silver oxide, silver sulfide, and cuprous oxide. These happen to be very, very common forms of the ghetto type deterioration. Actually, a silver sulfide and silver oxide are observed or have been reported more frequently than silver chloride. Silver sulfides are relatively easy to identify in the ghettotypes. They have a characteristic band between 180 and 190 reciprocal centimeters, and two bands that are not well defined in this particular case at 243 and 273. Um, but I wanted, what I wanted to show here is that when we use powers that are um, above 1.5 or 2 milliwatts at the sample or for longer exposures, this um, band starts to grow. This band is due to the uh, silver oxide that is most likely due to the uh, photo decomposition of the silver sulfide there. So lower powers need to be used uh, when we have a uh, silver sulfide. And uh, this is a very interesting case. I, I apologize, we don't, I mean, I didn't have a much, a, a better uh, image of this uh, daguerreotype. This daguerreotype is in our study collection. It's not considered a work of art. Uh, we acquire Raman spectra using a 514 excitation uh, every 100 seconds, uh, uh, going from uh, bottom to top. Uh, this, this daguerreotype, I don't have the color image, but has beautiful color uh, silver sulfide films. So when we inquire the spectra, what we see is that as, a, as a, a exposure to the beam increases, uh, we have the silver oxide uh, forming there. But we also see these uh, additional bands at 1440, 1580, and 2170. These bands are characteristic of cyanides. And what we think that is happening here is that as we expose the, the film, uh, silver redeposition is taking place, generating a certain substrate that allows us to pick up the cyanides. The cyanides in a, in a daguerreotype could, uh, ha, can have many different origins. Uh, we know that cyanides were widely used uh, in uh, restoration of daguerreotypes for, uh, as brighteners. Uh, silver cyanide, uh, cyanide solutions were used for plating the, the copper sheets during the manufacturing process. And also cyanides uh, were used for, were mentioned as suitable for removing the unexposed silver salts. Um, we thought uh, initially when we just started to examine the daguerreotypes and the, and the white haze, we thought that that could be um, the result of a coating. It, it turned out that it was not. But this uh, brought us to look into the, uh, whether we could um, identify coatings on daguerreotypes. Uh, different, um, Materials were recommended for coating daguerreotypes, uh, polysaccharides, uh, proteinaceous materials, uh, natural resins, and more recently, um, synthetic polymers were used for uh, protecting daguerreotypes against tarnishing. Those compounds are, um, in general, difficult to uh, pick up by Raman when mixed with a binding medium in a work of art, but they are relatively easier to identify when present as a coating on a, on a daguerreotype uh, or in other uh, metallic object. Um, uh, these are, this is a set of Raman spectra acquired in a, in a group of uh, proteinaceous materials, um, non-H samples. Um, what uh, we find is that uh, Raman can only allow us to tell the general group the compound belongs to. Uh, very, very rarely the vibrational information that we get allows us to tell the difference among members within the same uh, group. Uh, this is a group of uh, um, polysaccharides. Um, one can have a better spectra, uh, can overcome interference from fluorescence by doing FT Raman. And again, we can tell the difference uh, uh, between different groups, but uh, particularly if combined with uh, infrared, one can tell the difference among uh, subgroups, like here, between d terpenic and, and, and triterpenic resins. And if the spectra are, are good enough, one can tell the difference between, for example, within uh, a d terpenic, um, within the d terpenic group, one can tell the difference between copals and for example, Sandarac and Colophony by the presence of this uh, peak at 1715. Um, these are uh, infrared spectra acquired in the transmission mode, but for the particular case of the daguerreotypes for which a sample needs to be removed. But for the particular case of the daguerreotypes, one can get like very good spectra by infrared in transmission mode. So by combining the two techniques, one can really uh, get uh, more detailed information. 
um, this is the cam coating. And just a note on uh, the comparison of the spectra that one gets from a real work of art and the spectra that one uh, sees in a Raman spectral library. This is spectrum of a colophony resin uh, acquiring a non-H sample, and this is an H sample, and the red trace is a, a colophony varnish. And we see here how this band at 1650 decreases from the non-H to the H sample. This band is assigned to the olefinic stretch here that um, um, disappears or, or decreases uh, during oxidation and polymerization of the resin. Uh, it's also relatively easy to identify polymeric materials in um, negatives that um, can help uh, assigning um, a possible earlier date for um, uh, negatives. We know uh, when a certain uh, polymeric materials started to be used in negatives. Um, for example, here we have um, cellulose nitrate and camphor. Uh, so this is celluloid. Um, here the spectrum is cut here, but we did not see the carbonyl band that we would expect to see for the camphor. We don't have um, a convincing explanation for that, uh, but uh, this is uh, nonetheless, this is um, good spectra for uh, celluloid. I'm going to skip um, uh, salt paper prints. I think I have too many slides, and I'm gonna go um, straight into um, color lithographic inks used in 19th century posters. Um, these uh, early lithographic inks had uh, three main components, uh, the inorganic pigments, and after the synthesis, the first synthesis of MOVE by Perkins in the 1950s, organic, synthetic organic pigments started to be incorporated into the inks and very frequently mixed with inorganic pigments. The binding medium is, uh, generally was uh, processed linseed oil, and also, these inks had a large number of additives, um, natural resins, wax, soap, barite. So these inks are oil-based, but they can be water sensitive. And the main reason for that is that if um, the synthetic organic pigments are not uh, properly conditioned after precipitation and grinding, they tend to aggregate, so they won't disperse well in the oil. And w if they are not well dispersed in the oil, um, they may become uh, emulsified by the water during the printing process. And the problem is that these inks that are called waterlogged inks are very sensitive to water, to, wa to aqueous treatments. They tend to bleed, they tend to migrate, and the synthetic organic pigments tend to recrystallize. So identifying the synthetic organic pigments is crucial before one uh, conducts an aqueous conservation treatment. Um, Fortunately, synthetic organic pigments are relatively easy to identify in the um, posters. Uh, the binding medium in general does not interfere. Sometimes we find that um, strong peaks due to the inorganic pigments that were used as extenders interfere with uh, bands in the low wave number range. Uh, but uh, that's about it. Um, the libraries that we have are at this point uh, pretty extensive. We know that uh, over 500 synthetic organic pigments have been developed so far, and of those, uh, more than 160 have been used uh, in um, lithography. Uh, as I said, the libraries are pretty extensive. Uh, this is, um, to my knowledge, the um, most extensive one. It contains 125 pigments, about uh, 90 with different color index numbers. It was published in 2009 by Scherer and co-workers. So, um, one uh, could, in principle, be able to uh, tell the difference among uh, members of the same pigment family. But it happens that sometimes um, Raman spectra of those um, members of the same family differ only in the weakest bands that may not be um, visible when one looks at them in the real work of art. And a good example of these are the pigment blue 15, the copper of tallow blues. Um, the copper stylo blues occur in no less than five crystal modifications, and they all have different, um, solu different solubility, different stability um, properties. And of course, the fastness properties depend not only on the crystal modification, but also on the particle size, the shape, the state of aggregation, and also the presence of solid solutions or mixed crystals can bring about unexpected effects. So with this in mind, uh, Lynn Brostov, uh, Polona Ropret, and I decided to explore 
the application of micro X-ray diffraction to complement the identification of um, synthetic organic pigments by Raman uh, in works of art, and we look at different samples. Um, a particular, um, today I will be focusing in these uh, commercial paints that have different binders, oil, alkyd, and acrylic media with uh, a large number of unknown fillers, and also we look at age and non-age samples. <coughs> Uh, the nice thing about XRD is also that one can uh, not only look at microsamples, but it can also be done in situ in an, in a few, if one has an instrument with an open architectural configuration. So uh, the good news is that many synthetic organic pigments occur in the ICDD database, but um, we found that when we look at the commercial samples, the ones that were most likely to appear in, in, in a work of art, we found that um, unidentified peaks, you know, the, 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 the um, patterns that are in the ICD database are generally acquired in analytically pure samples. We also observe shifts in the disk spacings that could not, we could not attribute to uh, alignment problems, amorphous backgrounds. It got more complex with complex mixtures of synthetic organic pigments, and also we found that the ICD database, uh, particularly the older um, data has missing peaks and incorrect uh, intensity ranges. Um, and as I said, um, the, the, the results that we got depended on the binding medium, and in general, we could say, uh, I'm gonna go quickly through this, but uh, for the acrylic and the alkyd paints, uh, both techniques uh, work quite well. XRD was, had good quality additive patterns. Um, the inorganics did not interfere as they didn't in Raman. What happens is that in some cases, Raman did not give us enough um, detail to discriminate members within the same pigment family, such as uh, in the kinacudron pigments. And we could say in general that uh, they are both complementary. But uh, in the case of oil uh, binders, uh, we got uh, unexpected results. This is um, an XRD pattern that we acquire in a sample uh, with an oil binder, and this is, this is more or less representative of what we saw in the rest of the samples. By uh, X-ray diffraction, we got great detail on the inorganic extenders, uh, barite, zinc sulfide, uh, both in wood side and sphalerite forms, and also uh, zinc hydroxide. But we saw no peaks due to the synthetic organic pigment. This sample is yellow. And uh, we saw by Raman that this sample has uh, pigment yellow one, no doubt. There's uh, still one band here that we could not firmly identify. Raman also gave us information on the presence of uh, barium sulfate and the cubic um, form of zinc sulfide. But we are missing the hexagonal uh, form of zinc sulfide and the zinc hydroxide. So we can say that both techniques are complementary. XRD gave us, for the case of, uh, for the particular case of the oil samples, great detail on the inorganic components, but it did not give us any information on the synthetic organic pigment. And on the other hand, Raman gave us, uh, in all cases, all the pigments present and some of the extenders, but we did not get um, the detail that we got uh, with XRD. I just want to point out here that we did identify this pigment yellow one that we don't see here in the oil binder. We did identify this, the pigment when mixed with other oil binders. And um, our uh, um, explanation is that in the case of the oil, synthetic organic pigments are well dispersed and agglomerates are not formed and not even uh, aggregates. So the pigment is basically as a monocrystal or single crystal that are much harder to uh, detect uh, by uh, XRD. But in general, we can say that both techniques uh, complement each other really well. Logood inks. Um, Logood inks uh, can be made uh, basically by uh, boiling the hardwood of uh, this tree called Palo de Campeche and mixing the decoction with different inorganic salts, alum salts, iron salts, copper, chrome, and more commonly mixtures of, the, mixtures of these salts and adding uh, dextrin or gum as binders. The main colorant in uh, uh, the native state is this uh, molecule called hematoxylin that is colorless. As soon as hematoxylin is exposed to oxygen, it turns into <laughs> this um, molecule called hematein that is a deep red. There are other colorants there in the logwood uh, extract. 
uh, the derivatives of brasiline and other uh, colorants that are still, that haven't yet been uh, identified. So one can really obtain a wide range of hues by using different inorganic salts, by mixing these salts, and also by uh, changing the proportion of uh, logo to the um, inorganic salt. For example, the, the chrome logos are orange, the alum logos um, can be purple, but if one uses a larger proportion of logo to the alum salt, one can obtain this brownish reddish hue, and then the same thing with the iron and, and copper salts. These are spectra that we acquired with 488 excitation. This is a um, complex, um, or the ink, produced by mixing a methane and alum and an alum salt in a one-to-one -one proportion in the powder. It's, it's not applied on paper in this case, but we found that similar spectra were obtained when uh, the ink was applied on paper, and I go, I'll go quickly through this, but um, believe me, this is the case. And this spectrum is compared here to the spectrum of uh, pure dry emetein and the dry logo extract here. Uh, the extract has broader bands as one would expect for the uh, less pure material. Um, so what we see is that when one compares the spectrum of the pure uh, emetein and, and the emetein complex to alum, we see that the band that is assigned to the carbonyl stretch of emetein shifts when uh, the uh, molecule is complex to the aluminum atoms. This is telling us that the aluminum and the carbonyl are uh, interacting. And this is also the case of the aromatic stretches uh, and also of the uh, COH bands. And we also see in the compass an extra band at 646 reciprocal centimeters that is due to the aluminum oxygen stretch. So the spectra that we acquire in the logos gives us enough information to really uh, identify the inks and also differentiate them. These are uh, other inks, um, an alum, the, the alum that I just showed compared to the iron and, um, and an alum copper law good. Uh, the carbonyl doesn't shift so much with the metals, but uh, the aromatic uh, CC do, and also the COH um, bends shift. And more importantly, we have um, differences in the uh, metal oxygen. We have the 626 for the alum um, copper logo, um, and the 646. We have the 646 in the alum copper logo and the 626 that we assign to the copper oxygen. This is a pure alum logo, and this is a one formulation of uh, iron logo that gave broad bands there. We expect to see a bind at 4.30, at 5.30 for the chrome logo, and this is what we see in this Van Gogh drawing. Um, 5.30 here for the chrome uh, oxygen. Uh, it is possible to differentiate iron logos from iron gold inks. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't include um, iron golds because I thought that Ling uh, was going to include them. But I'm uh, just going to say here that uh, iron goalings give uh, characteristic bands that can be used to uh, characterize them and identify them and differentiate them from the uh, other iron containing inks. And finally, um, sepia ink, sepia is a little bit more complicated. Sepia is a melanin extracted from the ink sac of the different species of the cuttlefish, more commonly from uh, sepia officinalis. It is a copolymer. It has approximately 75% uh, uh, of the units derived from these uh, molecules, 5,6-D hydroxine dol to carboxylic acid. About 20% uh, of the um, units derived from this, 5,6-D uh, hydroxine dol. But these uh, oligomers are uh, degraded to these uh, pyrrole uh, carboxylic acid uh, molecules. And uh, as if this uh, weren't enough, we also have um, proteins called melanoproteins. They are in the uh, CP extracted from the um, cuttlefish. By XRF, sepia also gives iron. The cuttlefish concentrates iron and other metals. Um, and this, these are normal Raman spectra acquired in different sepia samples, some um, uh, sepia, commercial uh, sepia pigments from Seki and uh, Kramer. Um, to purify uh, sepia samples from Sigma and from Aldrich, and uh, a sepia that we extracted from the cuttlefish in the laboratory. 
Our samples show uh, a broadband here at uh, between 1583 and 1590, a broadband here at 1350, and this very uh, weak band that is sometimes a shoulder at 1413. So this is not um, great uh, um, detail if we look into spectra uh, of um, what other material uh, gave us. For example, Bister also has two broadbands. Charcoal has two broadbands around that uh, same uh, range. A completely different material, Van Dyke Browns, their humic acids also uh, give us uh, two broadbands in the same range. And so uh, do asphalts, uh, bitumen, and other humic acids. It is possible to discriminate a sepia by, um, from the rest of the samples by um, doing principal component analysis. Sepia really uh, separates from the rest of the um, materials. But if one wants to identify uh, these uh, asphalts, uh, Bandai Browns, one needs to do SERS. Um, and I just stop here. Um, I would like to thank uh, all the colleagues that I've worked with uh, in all this project that i just uh, shown you, and I also would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. And our last speaker today is uh, Dr. Leona. So we'll welcome him forward. Thank you. Well, thank you to uh, Final France and Lynn Brosta for organizing the symposium, inviting us, and for Rennish to support us uh, and get us here, get all the instruments. I know it's a lot of trouble. Um, you've heard everything you need to know about um, Raman. Uh, Richard showed you the equations. Uh, that, equations on, that equation with the polarizability term can be expanded and show you actually uh, even the polarizability factor um, is modified when you are in uh, surface condition, in surface enhancement uh, conditions. I just want to pick up a little bit on some examples. Why we do Raman? Raman is very powerful for a number of samples, of a number of objects where you actually cannot um, study the constituent materials in any other way. Uh, only one example. This is a reverse painted glass bowl. Uh, it's, uh, the glass is about eight millimeter thick in the center. The paint is on the back of that glass, so away from the surface. And underneath the paint layer is a five millimeter thick uh, layer of uh, pigmented wax. There's no way to get to the pigment but through the glass. You can do that with Raman quite conveniently. So that's what makes it uh, such a standout technique. Unfortunately, a number of materials that are of great interest in our field are problematic for Raman spectroscopy. Uh, you have seen examples of small organic molecules that were analyzed quite well, and a few of these molecules can be seen uh, in the right conditions through resonance or when extremely pure um, in uh, very well with normal Raman uh, techniques or with Fourier transform Raman. Um, however, on art objects, which are invariably heterogeneous, complex, complicated, and aged, we do encounter uh, two uh, problems. These uh, molecules, which have been used as organic colorants or textile dyes, are um, in generally fluorescent, so they bring up a lot of background, and they're always used in very small concentration. Why? Because they have very high tinting powers, and the two things go together. Uh, compounds have not been selected as dyes if they don't have this high economic advantage of requiring you to put very little to get a lot of color. This is just a selection of, of natural dyes. You see the anthraquinones, which are some of the most important reds. You've seen brazilian, physetin as a flavonoid, berberine, the only alkaloid, um, so basic natural dyes used in uh, East Asian art. Uh, this interesting pair here, shikonin and alkanin, which is an optical isomer at this position. One is uh, used in, in Japan, and one is uh, commonly used in uh, medieval Europe. You have, of course, also the synthetic dyes. Um, you can think of mauve, you can think of crystal violet. They're still important today as ink components. With these techniques, uh, with, with these uh, materials, 
we really have the, we're hitting the limit of Raman spectroscopy. Raman spectroscopy is um, a technique that exploits a very weak effect. The cross-section of Raman is very small. Fluorescence is a much more sensitive technique. You get more fluorescent photons per photon that you put in than Raman. If you compare uh, cross-sections, again, normal Raman fluorescence, SIRS, which we haven't told you what it is yet, uh, sort of fits in between, just can go up in terms of sensitivity to the level of fluorescence, and then we have these, we make a rather special distinction here between surface enhanced Raman scattering and surface enhanced resonance Raman scattering, where you're really going above the cross-section of fluorescence, so you're getting many more photons scattered that way. Uh, in reality, when we do surface enhancement in, with, with colloid, with plasmonic surface substrates, we also quench the fluorescence. So we, we increase this differential between the sensitivity of surface enhanced Raman and fluorescence. How can we then, uh, what, what is SURF and how can we, can we use it? In very, in just one sentence, surface enhanced Raman scattering is the giant enhancement of Raman scattering intensity experienced by a molecule absorbed on an atomically rough metallic surface. Again, we could go much more in depth onto what happens at the atomic level. You will hear always the expression, SIRS is a poorly understood effect. It is not. It's actually now a very well understood effect. We can engineer substrates. We can find the right conditions to get the best enhancement. What is perhaps not understood is the chemistry of the experiment, and we'll talk about that. The only uh, atomical scale illustration I'm showing you, uh, this is what happens. When you have a nanoparticle or an atomically rough metallic substrate, you are in a condition in which what happens at the substrate, at the surface of that metallic particle, so the electrons that you find at the surface, drive the physics and the chemistry of the metallic particle. We're not in a bulk uh, situation. We're really isolating the properties of the surface. And what you have, you have a collective wave of electrons at the surface of the nanoparticle that can be driven into oscillation by incident light, by an incident electromagnetic field, which is the one that we, act with our, we enact with our laser. When you have these resonance, you have wide oscillations of the electronic, electrical, electromagnetic field at the surface of the nanoparticle. Those, you get an enhanced electromagnetic field, which in turn interact with the molecule absorbed by the surface, with the incident beam, and with the scattered beam. The result is those orders of magnitude in enhancement of the Raman scatter. What, um, what, it, what are the problems with, um, with SIRS and how could we use it? It could be an ideal technique for um, organic molecules because through their delocalized electron structures, their donor acceptor uh, groups, they can efficiently absorb on metallic nanoparticles. They can get into um, charge transfer complexes with the metallic nanoparticle, therefore providing alternative paths for uh, electronic decay, so eliminating the fluorescence, and experiencing large enhancement in, uh, in scatter. If you go around and talk both to um, analytical chemists or even at the Raman conference, you will keep hearing um, issues uh, brought up about SIRS. People will talk about the lack of reproducibility of SIRS. You could imagine these uh, atomically rough nanostructures are very difficult to produce in a reproducible way, to get exactly comparable uh, topographies, to get exactly comparable enhancement factors. Uh, these materials may be, uh, people will tell you, not very stable, because you're talking about highly reactive uh, surfaces. You need to get molecules in uh, immediate contact with the surface to get the best enhancement, so oxidation and aging problems could be significant. In reality, at least in my impression, these are um, non-issues. Uh, we're talking about doing qualitative analysis, identification of molecules. We're not doing quantitation. So a change in 30% plus or minus of uh, efficiency in these, uh, or a 30% plus or minus limit of detection, 
is not a big deal. Spectral positions will stay stable as long as you control the chemical environment. This is, however, a method that has been, for many years, uh, studied more from a theoretical point of view, understanding the plasmonics and the physics uh, about it, than by an analytical chemistry point of view. So uh, there are not many molecules that have been studied in this way. There are not extensive libraries. There are significant chemical, um, small chemical differences, so, so sub, you know, small substitutions in related molecules can lead to very different chemical uh, affinity for metallic nanoparticles. So you can have, um, even between alizarin and purpurine, let's say, two antraquinones that differ only by an hydroxyl group, differences in their source sensitivity. And finally, um, as in any analytical method, interferences due to impurity, matrix components, and all that. This just means that if we want to make it into a practical method, we have to work on all those very, uh, very simple to address um, practical issues. It's, it's really a problem not of the, of the basic of the technique, but of how you carry out the in, um, experiment. Let's take a look. The first thing is supports. Uh, we talk about nanoparticles, uh, atomically rough substrates, plasmonic supports, all very difficult terms, but what they mean is really anything from um, a silver mirror that you can deposit with the Tollens reaction. Anybody, you know, it used to be an, um, a qualitative analytical chemistry test for silver. It's very easy to do. Uh, colloids, so you take, uh, let's say, silver nitrate and you reduce it in solution to produce a dispersion of silver nanoparticles in, in, uh, in water. This is one type, this is another type. Uh, you could deposit, by vapor deposition, uh, silver nano islands. You could, have, uh, you could do it with gold, and you can even now buy uh, commercial substrates that are uh, engineered to provide um, particular um, properties. We do most of our works with silver colloids. When you work with uh, silver colloids, you have plasmonic resonance, meaning that you will have absorption of light and resonance at a very distinctive frequency. This is the colloid that we like using. It's uh, generated by microwave reduction of uh, silver uh, with glucose. This is a more traditional colloid. It's called the Lee and Maisel colloid. It's a stovetop colloid. You boil silver nitrate with, with sodium citrate. Has a broader um, response in the sense that it will resonate over this range of uh, excitation frequencies, but it's uh, less stable. When you work with a colloid, what you will do is uh, you will induce aggregation of the colloid. You will create a situation in which two or more nanoparticles uh, form a, uh, an aggregate, and you have a, an area here between the, the join or the point of um, you know, the kissing point here where uh, electromagnetic fields are enormously enhanced. It's, it's almost as if this is an antenna. When the molecule sits here, you will now be able to get Raman spectra from even a single molecule. It's been done. What you have to understand, however, is that you're now, for best, um, for best, best performance, you have to deal with being able to create repeatedly, if not reproducibly, this type of structure and to get the molecule there. This has to do with the um, chemistry of the colloid and the chemistry of the molecule. Some molecules will want to go here um, quite well, others will not. You will see different results in this case. Because we're working in water, water-soluble dyes have a better chance of getting in that situation than, say, something like copper thalocyanin or a quinacridone that are not soluble. Our protocol, starting from the colloid to, um, to the spectrum, um, takes into account all of the steps to try to increase sensitivity and broaden applicability. We're starting with microsampling, so taking the smallest sample possible. We pretreat that sample in ways that are different for each type of uh, situation, but are um, but designed to optimize uh, the absorption and then detection. We have, as, as I said, reproducible colloid. We work as much as we can as resonance ex excitation. That means hitting exactly the peak of that, uh, or as close as we can, the peak of that absorption of the, the colloid, the plasmonic resonance. And then we have de developed a search spectral library that takes into account all possible 
modification, uh, spectral shifts due to chemical environment, uh, pH, complexations, and other, um, other effects representing uh, the most common organic uh, dyes. It's easy for the natural ones. For the synthetic ones, of course, you have a much larger number, so we're still adding to that. If we can, I'll, uh, get, I'll try to talk about some other approaches that f would further improve, the, uh, further improve the applicability of SIRS, including um, standardizing the colloid delivery, the application to the sample, uh, doing something like um, solid phase microextraction to um, approach non-destructive analysis, and finally expanding uh, the range of uh, wavelength using an optical parametric oscillator source as the laser, so a tunable laser. Just quickly, uh, this is a very simple experiment. From sampling to obtaining a spectrum, uh, it takes less than 30 minutes. We use a tungsten needle to remove the sample. This is a paper fiber from um, a paint out in a, in a uh, 1920, 1920s uh, catalog of dyes. Uh, the dye is, uh, the, the fiber with a few pigment grain is treated quickly by exposure to hydrogen fluoride. You could use other uh, approaches. The idea is that these are lakes, so they're uh, insoluble complexes of a dye with an uh, inorganic um, ion. We're trying to hydrolyze that without diluting, without extracting. This is the treated fiber. It measures probably 150 micron. The nanoparticles are added simply by depositing a drop of colloid on top of the sample. And what you see here is as the dye is diffusing out of the sample, it's causing aggregation of the colloid. You go from the yellow of the dispersed, uh, perfectly stable colloid to uh, a brownish, reddish tint to the darker, fully aggregated nanoparticles. When you look at it through the um, objective of the microscope, you see these are the um, sensi high sensitivity aggregates. And finally, simply by pointing the laser beam into the drop, not even at the, uh, at the sample that still contains uh, unreacted dye, we get a beautiful spectrum. This is eosin, um, which has been used, as everybody knows, by Van Gogh and has problems with fading and all that. The experiment takes, as I say, less than half an hour to do from the sampling, literally, to these uh, steps. It's a very simple thing. Uh, let's break down the, the steps and, and go, a little, go, a little bit, go a little bit in detail. I talked about microwave synthesis. Why I think it's um, interesting, the, uh, the Lian Maisel College, which has been used in for 20, 30 years in an hundreds of um, SIRS experiments is a great support. Uh, it's great if you're going to longer wavelengths, but uh, it is known for being not uh, extremely stable. It is also, the, the, the breadth of its plasmonic resonance is also a little bit of a problem. We prefer what we obtain with the microwave, which is what is called a monodispersed um, colloid, a colloid with a very narrow particle size distribution. Uh, we get better response, and we're working with red, red dyes in the blue, so we have um, a triple resonance condition. What, the other thing that we discover is that it's of easy, very easy manufacture and incredible stability. It will maintain its properties for about six months if stored in the fridge. You don't need, um, th this is a comparison of the, um, of the uh, absorption, so again, uh, an idea of the narrow particle size distribution. This is the uh, microwave colloid. Uh, you could uh, produce it, like in the picture I showed you, with a laboratory microwave. You can also use a home microwave adapted for laboratory use. Uh, you just need to be a little bit more careful in watching the power applied to the solution. Stability is a key point. Um, if you're doing forensic work or industrial work or food um, colorants work, you can't deal with something that will change its properties in, the, in six days, in six months. Uh, here, uh, we're taking an optical absorption spectrum of the colloid at intervals. And what we see is that we don't have absolutely any change in the optical absorption. This means that the 
nanoparticle size distribution, the aggregation state of the colloid remains the same. We would see that in, uh, in, an opt in a UV-vis uh, absorption spectrum. The activity of the colloid does tend to go down. We get a 20% drop after six, six months. Uh, we can't quite explain that, but we can imagine that something happens to the surface chemistry of the colloid that would make uh, sticking of the dye to it a little bit more uh, problematic. Yet, um, it's, it is an extreme case. It doesn't cost anything, and it takes one minute to make, so you could make it every month if you want. Sample treatment is a key point. Whenever I talk about treating a sample with HF, um, I, it sounds like I could, you know, I'm, I'm asking you to smuggle a plutonium bomb into your laboratory. Um, HF is not uh, the nicest reagent to deal with. Uh, those of us who work near painting, near painting conservators know that there are plenty of other uh, problematic um, reagents. They're called solvents, and they're used for cleaning paintings. Um, we use 10 microliter of HF inside this little uh, conical capsule. So this is our reactor chamber. This is our sample holder. This 10 microliter of HF will last you three or four days. So you can treat a lot of samples with that. We take small samples. This is 20 micron. We actually did not take this sample because it's very difficult to take a 20 micron uh, fragment off of a painting. This is the little crumb that was sitting next to a larger sample. Uh, so, but we can use a sample like this. And this is a comparison of what happens uh, when you uh, do the treatment as opposed to when you not, don't do the treatment. Now, we don't take two samples from a Cezanne just to indulge into analyzing it with HF treatment or without. We first look at it. We put a drop of colloid on top of it, record the spectrum, what, all we see are the bands of uh, the blank, if you want, the, uh, the, the bands that we get from the colloid. And then we suck away the colloid. It's just water. Take the sample, treat it with HF, and reapply a fresh drop of colloid. And you start seeing all these peaks developing, corresponding perfectly, in this case, to a reference spectrum of matter. So it's a very, very uh, powerful method. We, don't, we can play a lot with a 20 micron sample until we get the appropriate results. Now again, for the forensic people, talking about, I'll do the colloid, uh, I take it out, uh, I treat it if I don't get a good result, um, that can sound like uh, I'm making it up as I go, which is part of what I do. But we believe that if you, uh, if you develop a protocol where the steps are um, listed, in sequence and you then apply it consistently, that is also uh, a defensible approach. So, you know, you would try, try first on the least invasive approach, which is the non-treated sample, applying the colloid, you remove it, then you'll add this. So we have um, kind of a gradual approach that is developed to tease out the result uh, from the material. When it doesn't work, we admit that we didn't see it. It may still be there. This is maybe the time for a parenthesis. I don't want to sell SIRS as the ultimate method to do dye analysis. If you can do LCMS, you should be doing LCMS. That is especially important for organic, uh, natural organic dyes. These are very complex mixtures, and here we're still deal dealing with the spectroscopic technique that is not a separation technique. There's actually a mistake. It's, it's a mistake to say that SIRS is not a separation technique. It partially is a separation technique because only the dye that has the highest affinity for silver will be seen predominantly. So you may think about it. You may have two components. One is a, a minor component but high affinity for silver. You may imagine any dye that has a pending NH group. And the other may be a major component but has a poor reactivity affinity with silver. It could be um, a dye with a negative charge. You will see the minor one in preference over the other. So you need to evaluate these factors. Still, you cannot do a CMS with a 20 micron sample unless uh, you know better than me. Um, library search and match is the other key fun thing for us. When we're dealing with organic dyes, natural organic dyes, we have a very uh, small selection. So we can easily look at spectra and try to do an eye 
uh, a match by I. If we're going into um, a larger set, we need to be able to do it by uh, automated library search and match. And whenever we do that, um, whenever we, we talk about this, we hear the, um, the objection. How are you going to deal with the fact that because of this chemical sensitivity, you may have uh, shifts in peak position due to pH, due to the, the shape and the conformation the dye will take, the way it will absorb on silver. Well, it's simply, you build um, a very large library and you see if it works. And what we've seen is that overall, it works. Um, if you've done FDIR, you know that you can do, um, nobody would question that you can do a library search. You just like run a library search and you'll see. Now, um, I would also like to know how many times the first hit that you get in your library is exactly what you're looking for. Um, so um, here with, with our library, which is namely um, um, a search optimized library, looking at um, standard, looking at samples that we encounter in the course of our work, we see in generally a very good correspondence between reference and uh, sample. In the few cases, we're talking where we didn't get a good result. We, you know, we're still identifying Matter Lake as the main component, but the, um, the pH shifts were not really taken into account too well. But to me, it's an indication that this is a rather robust technique. And we could do it with uh, PCA to show that really there's a very good um, possibility of doing lab research. I want to show you just quickly uh, a few examples. We've studied over a hundred um, samples with SIRS uh, covering the extent of what you'd find in a museum, which is you know, pretty much everything under the sun, from paintings uh, to works of art on papers, uh, polychrome sculpture, textiles, modern and earlier uh, paintings, um, objects that, are, that have very unusual support, such as dyed feathers. This bag is also very interesting because it contains, um, this is a bag, it contains coca leaves. We haven't tried to analyze the leaves for, um, for their content, and maybe we should leave it at that. Um, this is an object from uh, Mexico, um, early colonial times. Um, it is a feather mosaic. So it's a typical technique of Aztec times, here repurposed for the new Spanish masters with a subject that would be clearly more appealing to them. And what we looked here, we took a little tiny sample from the barbs of these feathers. It turns out they're dyed with um, cochineal. So the feathers would be dyed uh, and then arranged in the, in the pattern. There is no problem in applying search even to uh, a material of this type. If you look at these with normal Raman, the subject's fluorescent, the dye is fluorescent, you don't see anything. This is uh, an Ottoman carpet uh, supposed to date from the, it's from Romania, it's supposed to date from the uh, 17th century. It shows uh, patterns of wear, it shows repairs, but if you look at the blue fibers, and you can take only just a few fibers, you will see that the spectrum is uh, very close to that of Nile blue, an oxazine dye that was first synthesized in the 1890s. So um, it turns out to be a forgery. Uh, it's, it's an easy case because in, that, in, in this sense, we have a date for the, for the dye, and the only um, natural alternative really would have been indigo. The, um, Age uh, and aging factor don't seem to interfere. This is um, a small leather object. It's, it's about this big. It's a fragment from a quiver. We took a sample, uh, this time extraordinarily small, um, really the sample in the first time, and uh, we were able to detect um, the signature of Mather, the um, very common natural dye. Uh, the object is 4,000 years old. As far as I know, it's the earliest, er earliest um, evidence for the use of matter as a dye. Uh, what is interesting also, a, a colleague in Los Angeles who's done some research on that, uh, pointed out that the spectrum we get from uh, all these objects using antiquity, uh, made in antiquity and dyed with matter, seems to correspond to pseudopurpurine. And pseudopurpurine is a minor component in modern 
matter, but it was the main component in wild matter. So it dates to before the cultivation of these uh, dyes. So it was just like a really the earliest uh, use of it. Uh, substrates on paper are, are, are quite, um, quite easy to look at uh, with this technique. Again, a small uh, sample. And here we get um, a good spectrum of carmine. Uh, I want to point out, talking about library searches, how, how good of a correspondence you have from with, between the, uh, the sample from the Cezanne uh, watercolor here and a, um, a sample, a reference that was very, um, very similar in this case. It's, it's, um, we took a, a sample from a Winsor & Newton catalog where they have paint outs of watercolors and, and you get absolutely the same um, spectrum, uh, which is interesting because, again, different aging, different conservation. It may have been the same um, watercolor, I don't know, that they used. Uh, these are samples that are taken without regard to how big one sample is, how big is the sample from the object, so we try to eyeball it, but they both HF treated. So throughout all of these stages, we maintain the, the, the parallel and we get the same response from the reference and from the, um, the sample. You can do with search a lot of things. Uh, you can hyphenate it if you want or uh, it's, it's versatile. Here we were interested in mauveine. Uh, mauveine is the first um, synthetic dye. Uh, it is actually composed of uh, at least four mauveine type molecules named A through D and um, a fifth component, which is slightly more orange in color. If you try to take a normal uh, Raman set spectrum of mauveine, you will not get anything. It's too fluorescent at any wavelength. It's also too absorbing uh, for FT Raman. It will deteriorate before you can get a, uh, a good Raman spectrum. SIRS not only works to give you a spectrum, but uh, can be applied on a TLC plate that, w that you have developed to separate the four components and you simply spot the plate here with silver or if you want this is preparatory TLC you can remove and isolate and you will get the spectra. These are the spectra straight from the um, from the plate. They show the, um, the differences between the different uh, isomers. Um, Two things. Of course, those of you who've done uh, TLC uh, will agree with me that this is a rather uh, pathetic example of TLC. We can get nice separation. This was a 20 by 20 plate, so we got the banding uh, a little bit imperfect. But I like the aesthetic effect, so it's my uh, Rothko-like uh, painting. Um, it should be clear, you've, you've all seen many articles on TLC uh, SIRS uh, recently, um, it should be very clear that if you can see the spot by visual uh, methods such as you know, UV, light or something, you don't need SIRS. What we're trying to demonstrate, and this was not the case but we have other examples coming, is that you can get with SIRS sensitivity below uh, optical uh, UV detection. So we, we have spots that are too faint to be seen by the naked eye. On top of that, you get molecular characterization of that spot, which I think is quite important. Um, can we do non-destructive search? Um, we cannot do non-contact, we cannot do non-invasive, but we can try to approach it. And one of the things that we can do is try to do uh, solid phase microstruction. So if we use a gel, much as they are used in gel cleaning, to remove a small amount of material from a substrate without inducing any mechanical damage and controlling the extraction so that we don't have any fading or any bleeding of the dye, we could perhaps call that pseudo or quasi non-destructive. And here's the example. This is a line with a modern gen, you know, um, commercial gel pen on a filter paper substrate. This is our extraction support, which is uh, a type of gel which was given to me by Glenn Gates. He knows it very well. It's uh, contact lens, uh, soft contact lens material. Uh, in this case, we have prolonged the extraction, and as you know, uh, gel pens, they're quite prone to, the, the components are quite soluble, to show the, the line that we have uh, extracted conformal to the original um, 
paint out. Uh, so you could say, and, and there's, a, there's a slight fading or change here due to the compression and the action of the gel. Uh, you could say this is uh, definitely not non-destructive. Of course, um, in the forensic field, I think the uh, standard way to take a sample is this, which <laughs> is slightly more destructive. I don't. Um, so that's why I call it non-destructive. We can, of course, prove that it will not alter the, the, some of the key values, and the key values for us, it's, it's uh, appearance, uh, uh, color change. And um, looking at these, um, Japanese print, which is my test object. It's mine, it's not the museum's. Uh, we look at these blue. Uh, we got a spectrum for uh, metal violet, which would have been uh, the dye of choice in late uh, 19th century Japan. And we did take a spectrum with a fiber optic probe to measure the color before and after the, the extraction on the same spot. And what we get is a uh, a very small difference. Uh, these, you, you can calculate based on this curve what the color change is. It all amounts to a delta E uh, lower than one, which is the accepted value for what a human observer can, uh, can differentiate. So to me, it's a promising approach. Other groups have used other gels. It's been demonstrated with agar gel, with methyl cellulose gel, and of course, with the advances in uh, use of gels for cleaning works of art, there could be better uh, supports. In our case, it's it's a transfer, so we do microextraction with the gel, and then we spot the gel with the colloid. Um, a group recently has published the same technique, but for reading a TLC plate, so that you spot off the TLC plate, but the TLC plate remains, if that's part of your record. Um, colleagues in Italy have used silver nanoparticles embedded in the gel, which may have some advantages, because you may be able to um, monitor the transfer as you do the experiment by SIRS. Finally, um, if I were interested in making the, um, the spotting, the delivery of the colloid uh, even more standardized, we could use um, inkjet, which has the advantage of making the spots very small. So this could be an alternative way of doing it in situ. Nobody at the Library of Congress or at the Metropolitan Museum will uh, be um, enthusiastic at the prospect of adding silver nanoparticle to any artifact, but there are cases in which this may be doable and, um, and perhaps better than alternatives. You can deliver with, with, with inkjet uh, droplets as small as 50 uh, micrometer in diameter, which will um, kind of like conform to, uh, to areas of interest in the substrates. And you can easily do this um, to be integrated with the uh, Raman spectrometer. Again, the, the poor <laughs> print I used for the experiments, shown here under our microscope with the delivery device in place, and the result, which again is a very uh, good spectrum for crystal violet. Don't tell me crystal violet is an easy one, and in the best case you can also see it without SIRS. Yes, but this is a proof of concept. The last thing, um, still in the, always on the, um, the idea of making SIRS uh, and the sampling um, aspect of SIRS more uh, less invasive and more spatially resolved. Because up to, the, up to now, we cannot do uh, spatially resolved search. The, our limit, our spatial resolution, is the dimension of the droplet. So if my smallest droplet is 50 micron, my spatial resolution would be 50 micron. Anything in that footprint will go in contact with the silver. Here we've developed um, a Raman system, which we built ourselves, uh, completely modular. And what it can do, uh, we have a tunable excitation with an optical parametric oscillator, anything from 400 nanometer to 2.2 micron, so we can exploit resonances uh, in every area. But we can also, using the pulsed output of the OPPO, ablate the sample. So we can ablate a sample, a very small area, 5 micron uh, ablation crater. And we work now with a, uh, um, a sample chamber, which would sit here. Uh, which is fitted with, each, with a transparent SIRS substrate. So we can go through it, ablate the sample, deposit it on the surface of the uh, transparent uh, window, if you want, and then we get beautiful spectra from uh, pigments that are insoluble. So would not be easy to study with traditional SIRS method. 
Here you have the case of two uh, quinacridone, quinacridone, quinone pigments as an example. The system looks a little bit like this. Bef this is the system before the addition of the uh, OPO and uh, the vacuum chamber. So this is the work for the next uh, few years, I believe. Well, thank you. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank our speakers for their amazing, wonderful talks, and also like to special thanks to Dr. Lynn Brostoff for organising this, and also the two people in the front row, Mary Uwe and Ray Privet, who have struggled with some IT challenges for the last three weeks, and without what happened yesterday, last evening, we would not be able to transmit this talk, so thank you. So can you please join me in giving a very huge thank you to all of our organisers and our speakers. And I'd like to now invite our four speakers back up to the podium and open up for questions. And I'll also check to see if we have any questions from off-site. Do we have any questions? Uh, first of all, can I invite you all back up, please? And I see a hand back over here. You can direct it to anyone specific, or the, whoever is interested can come up and answer. So. And I will rephrase the question, so if you can just give me one question at a time, and I'll rephrase it so that our off-site people can actually hear as well. The question um, was identification of uh, components in the daguerreotype. No, uh, <coughs> sir, what is the treatment on the daguerreotype? That's a very difficult question because that silver that was part of the that silver that was part of the daguerreotype image had uh, a form silver chloride, and then it redeposited a silver when exposed to light. So that silver that redeposited comes from the image. So it will be very, very difficult to s make that silver come back to the image particle. I don't think so. The point here and the questions that we are trying to answer is that um, are there any environmental conditions that we can use to safely show those agarotypes that are chlorine contaminated, uh, that are contaminated by chlorine? At this point, many, a couple of daguerreotype exhibitions, not many, have been cancelled. So we really don't know what... Um, if, if these daguerreotypes can be shown. Uh, I don't think that uh, they are going to be treated um, any time soon. There's, there are no treatments at the moment. Can you have one more question? The question was in regards to Marco's extraction with the, uh, the, the lens, uh, had he tried this with any other colorants? Yeah, that, that's really a method taken from um, all those who have worked on gel cleaning. So there's an extensive uh, amount of work and the, um, it does work. It's, it's gel that's loaded with the uh, EDTA, DMF uh, water solution, so it will extract a number of uh, mordant dyes, uh, organic pigments, and you could change the chemistry. That the, the advantage of the gel is that it will be, um, it can be loaded with a number of um, polar solvents uh, or polar solvent systems that will allow you to do that. So yes, it does work. The question was, is there a well-defined uh, explanation, or accepted explanation of non-invasive? And I think that's something, yeah, and non-destructive. Generally, and I'll open it up for others, but generally within the cultural heritage field, we're, we're trying to 
basically it's either non-contact or minimal contact and no actual removal of material from the surface of the item we're looking at. Uh, that would be what we would generally consider as non-invasive. And as Marco noted, we, we kind of almost at the area where we're merging between non-invasive to microanalytical in terms of actually defining how much are you changing the surface. I'll open that up to, to others. <laughs> a number of people here can weigh in. I think people like to kind of dodge that one a little bit. Um, I would add to the non-invasive definition is that it's not, not only not contact, but also it shouldn't leave a permanent change in the sample material that you're looking at, rather than not contact alone. Yeah, I, I would just add that, you know, the, it's non-destructive has been used very loosely in the field for a long time, and so people are trying to define that better. Um, because, of course, in uh, Science is non-destructive is not destroying your sample. So, um, but we, uh, I would say you're correct, I think, in your observation that uh, sometimes it's not well defined. And people do use non-destructive, often meaning non-invasive, so. And I'm just going to open up. Sylvia, we had one question from off-site. Could you just repeat the question and, and address uh, it? I didn't get to read it. I was reading it oh. and I got another question, so shall I? Would you like to okay. read it? Can you just read it out to me and I'll repeat it? The question was about the uh, the logwood. Yeah, the spectra for a metal logwood. Um, she had spectra for the ink on the paper and without paper. And she said, uh, John Beatty asked, um, but when you have paper and you have a phosphorescence problem, so how does she deal with that? So the question was in terms of log logwood spectra on and without paper. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference in dealing with the fluorescence? Uh, this is from John Beatty. Yes, the, the spectrum on the paper has a fluorescent background, but that, doesn't, that, that does not interfere with uh, the uh, observation of the main bands due to the complex. We did find that the complex that you have in the powder is slightly different than the complex that you have on paper. We observed those differences by nuclear magnetic resonance. What we see in the Raman is exactly the same spectrum, only with a different fluorescent background. Um, so, We have three more questions I see. Um, just behind Eric and then Eric next. So the question was for Lynn in terms of in situ Raman. First of all, the depth of the signal when we're doing it in situ, and also can a, a profile be created? I, I am going to refer to Rich because he's uh, really more of an expert. But you, you micron, and you can you can do depth profiling. The software is set up to do depth profiling. Yeah, so if you're if you're doing uh, looking at surfaces, generally you're limited by the the physics of the optics, so the depth of penetration is affected by the absorption of the material. So if you are perfectly transparent and no scattering, a standard 50x objective would easily have a, a sampling depth of 3 to 5 microns. Uh, it could be a little bit better, but typically 3 to 5 is what I would uh, tell somebody. Uh, if it's transparent, you can sample deep into the uh, material itself, and as the further you go in, the larger the collection volume becomes because of refractive index effects. So you can get good surface depth profiling limited by the NA of the objective that you use. Eric. So the question for Marco was, in terms of the SIRS and the, his comments about separation, whether, it's, whether there is, anyone has looked at modifying the colloids with organics to extract and look at classes of dye molecules. 
there's uh, there's a company that makes a um, sol gel uh, synthesize and, and, and gel polymer gel hosted uh, nanoparticle that acts also as a um, chromatographic phase if you want and they have some commercial products available in, in drug testing but it is actually more interesting than that you don't need to modify the silver to create a chromatographic support uh, there's a paper that recently appeared on lab on a chip where they use a uh, nano rod silver substrate as essentially a chromatographic plate. And you're talking about something that where you get like, I think at best 10 millimeter uh, runs, but where you can separate different dyes based on their affinity for the silver surface. So the absorption on the silver and the partition between that and a mobile phase allows you to do uh, ultra thin layer chromatography. We had a question in the back. The question is, uh, could Sylvia please uh, address the, the slide she didn't look at uh, in terms of the salted print? Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Um, can we get the slides, yes. maybe? Um, I'm sorry, I had too many slides. I sent the PowerPoint on Monday, and then I realized that I had too many slides. Um, so for those who are not familiar with what a solid paper print is, uh, very quickly, um, I think they come, they come after the daguerreotypes. Did it go down? Yeah. Oh, no, no. No, I think it was before. Oh, it was before? Yeah. Oh, yes, the previous one, yeah. So salted paper prints are first prepared by uh, dipping them in uh, a sodium chloride solution or a bromide, a potassium bromide or potassium iodide, and then in silver nitrate. And later on, gallic acid was used for making them uh, more light sensitive. They're exposed to light. And then uh, two, two different processes can be used to fix them or stabilize them. Sodium thiosulfate can be used and uh, there should be an excess of sodium thiosulfate, so this complex is formed and then exposed silver salts are completely removed. If that uh, hypo solution, as the uh, sodium thiosulfate solution is called, is, is, um, is exhausted or not, uh, doesn't it have an excess of uh, sodium thiosulfate, silver sulfide is formed that can uh, have a um, deleterious effect for the print. These prints are called fixed when they are treated with the sodium thiosulfate. Another way of stabilizing the print, uh, the prints uh, is uh, to wash them with uh, sodium chloride, potassium bromide, or potassium iodide to turn that residual uh, silver uh, chloride or silver allied into a less reactive form. And then toners are added. So um, it's important to identify the, the allies, and this is something that can be done by X-ray fluorescence. But uh, by Raman, we have bands that are characteristic of each allied. But the uh, interesting thing here is that it's possible to identify mixed allies. Uh, so by X XRF, we will only get the elements, the chlorine, the bromine, the I iodine. But by Raman, we could also see whether some mixed allies are present, and that would have to do with the stability of the print. I don't know if that uh, answers the question. Sorry. Do we have any other questions? Slides? I was really interested in the uh, new research on the AFF burst and the idea of coating the chip. And I was wondering if anyone had ever tried uh, coating a, a, a contact injector where if issue and would that type of thing be possible where issues of resolution are perhaps not so much of a concern? So the question was in terms of the uh, discussions about AFM SIRS encoding the tip, um, has anything been looked at further in terms of contact objective and the resolution issues? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with anyone tr necessarily trying that. You know, the, the goal is to have increased sp uh, spatial resolution, typically in s surface sensitivity. So if you know where the particles are on your contact objective, uh, that certainly is something you could try. It's certainly something that people do, uh, you know, as Marco showed, actually with his gel. If, if you had a gel that could be used in contact with both the objective and the sample, it sort of serves the same purpose. 
But the question is, does it help you uh, have improved spatial resolution? In that case, probably not. It's, uh, you really want the single particle on a tip. And one of the things, uh, much as I mean, the the, uh, the TERS is is a phenomenally uh, promising field. It's actually applications already real, but you have to keep in mind that that is uh, a model that works wherever AFM or SPM uh, techniques would work. So you're really talking about uh, very clean surfaces where you're interested in the surface. When we're talking about our objects between the nanoparticle and the molecule of the dye that you're interested in, there's likely to be a lot of other stuff, and it's very easy to, to put half a nanometer of non-interesting stuff in between you and the nanoparticle and uh, block the experiment, if you want. So it's, it's the same, would be the same thing if we used, uh, you know, sometimes with the gels that have the, the nanoparticles Im embedded. What works is the, the fact that the, the dye migrates from the substrate into the gel and then in contact with the nanoparticles. But I would be careful about any surface contact method because the contact may not be with what you want to identify. Any other questions from our friends in forensics? No? Okay, well, I. First of all, I just want to again thank you all for being here. Um, we're just delighted to be able to share this research with you and also to our people off site. And again, can you please join with me in thanking our four wonderful speakers? This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.